I consider it an honor to be on this stage and, and be with you in our time together today. Um, and I, I want to kind of go ahead and give some people an out, because as I was studying this message, I realized that this message isn't for everybody. And it's really difficult in the kind of culture that Elevation has to get a message ready for everybody because you guys have like um, 87 million campuses and you're starting one on the moon next week and that's gonna be amazing. Um, and there's all kind of people here. There's all kind of ages and races and economic backgrounds. And so that's what I love. It's, it's kind of like a picture of heaven, right? It's kind of like a picture of heaven. And so... So coming up with a message that impacts everybody is a challenge. So today, 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 I'm only going to be talking to the people who have a problem getting past your past. The only people I'm going to be talking to today are the people who have a problem getting past your past. Now, if you don't have a problem getting past your past, we're glad you're here today, Jesus. <laughs> but for the honest people in the house, we all have a problem sometimes getting past our past. I was thinking about this and um, in the sixth grade, I was in the sixth grade and, uh, and the school I went to, it was an it was, uh, elementary school. It, sixth grade's now part of most middle schools, but um, I'm from Easley, South Carolina where we just got running water last week. And so we always kind of, we're a little slow to the game. And so sixth grade was a part of elementary school. And in elementary school, I was a large child, large child. And, and, and so I didn't do well in certain subjects like PE, physical education. Now, in our elementary school, I don't know what genius came up with this, but we had PE immediately following lunch. Now, I, I don't know what school administrator was like, <laughs> but, but they planned PE right after lunch. So on this particular day, by the way, this complete story is true. Nothing is embellished. Um, it happened exactly the way I'm going to tell you. Um, on this particular day, we went to lunch and we had Mexican food. Now, I don't know what Mexican food does to you, but to me, it, yeah, let's just leave it there. You know what it does. All right. And so then we went from, P, we went from lunch into PE. And on that day, we were doing the president's physical fitness challenge. And, oh, it gets better. <laughs> On that particular day, the, the challenge that we were all going to do were sit-ups. And so, we numbered. You know how you, know how you used to pick partners in, in PE? It was like one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, and the ones and the twos would partner together. Well, I was number one, and number two was Tara Ann. And Tara Ann was the hottest girl in the world. A sixth grade hot, don't get me wrong, sixth grade hot, okay? She was sixth grade hot and I had a crush on Tara Ann. In fact, every boy in the sixth grade, fifth grade, and the fourth grade had a crush on Tara Ann. She was absolutely beautiful and Tara Ann was gonna hold my feet while I prepared to do sit-ups in the president's physical fitness challenge. And in my heart, I just knew this was my opportunity. I was gonna win Tara Ann over. She was gonna fall madly in love with me because I was gonna do sit-ups with such style and such precision that she was gonna say, you are my man. And I was gonna say, yes, I am. <laughs> so we, we assumed the position. She was holding my feet. What, 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 what I have for lunch? So she was holding my feet. And the coach blew the whistle. And it was like, one, two. And on the third sit-up. <laughs> I parted her hair. It was unreal. I started crying. I'm not making this up. I quit. I failed the president's physical fitness challenge. She was fine. We called 911. We got her some emergency help. We got her. I never will forget the look on her face as she was passing out. And I just, it was that event 
in elementary school that stuck with me forever. So in middle school, when we went to middle school and I'd see Terry Ann walking down the hallway, she would be coming this way and be like, oh, I'm just gonna get behind this. Because I ruined her life. I feel like I had a part in killing some brain cells. Um, I never will forget in high school, she was walking down the hallway with her boyfriend at the time and I was walking towards him. I was like, you know what? I need to kind of duck because she might tell him what I did and he might try to beat me up, which I could have taken him. It wasn't that big of a deal. But I was really embarrassed. Every time I saw her, I was really, really, really embarrassed. I'm not making this up. 10 year high school reunion. I'm at the football game. And I'm standing there and somebody's pulling on my shirt, pulling on my shirt. And I hate that, by the way. And they're pulling on my shirt. And I turned around and it was Tara Ann. And she looked at me and said, I bet you don't remember me. I was like, there's not a day that goes by that I don't think about the time I nearly killed you. And that's an event in my past. And, and while it's, it's funny, it really did happen. But I'm convinced that there's some people in this room that we've got something in our past and it's not that funny. And when I say past, let me kind of define it a little bit because a lot of times in church when we talk about the past, we're talking like 10, 20, 30 years ago, but I'm talking as the, like last night, past. Last week, past. Last month, past. There are every person in this room, there's probably an event or a season that you wished just didn't happen. And it's either what you did or what was done to you. And so I wanna, I wanna visit just one verse today. It's found in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter five. And I wanna look at this one verse because the apostle Paul, um, by the way, he wrote more information to the church in Corinth than any church in the Bible. Because the church in Corinth was a jacked up church. Jacked up. I'm talking about they were getting drunk during the Lord's Supper. When you get drunk in the Lord's Supper, you've got problems. He was having to address issues that shouldn't have to be addressed. So the entire church is full of jacked up people. By the way, did you know, did you know that the church today is full of jacked up people? In fact, go ahead and look at the person next to you and tell them, you're jacked up. Hold on, hold on. Oh, some of you enjoyed that a little bit too much. It was just a continuation of the conversation you had on your way to church. But the Apostle Paul, he's, he's writing this church in Corinth, and in the middle of chapter five, he, he, he almost pauses his thought, and he, and he speaks some encouragement, and he speaks some life into this church in Corinth. And this is what he says in 2 Corinthians chapter five, verse 17. This means, this meaning what he had referred to, that anyone, say anyone, one, two, three. Anyone. anyone. Now, um, I did not finish seminary, but I have studied a little bit of Greek. And in the Greek, that word anyone means anyone. That's about all I got when it comes to seminary education. <laughs> this means that anyone who belongs to Christ, you've given your life to Christ, Jesus has saved you, you've asked Jesus Christ to come into your life. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. See, the problem wasn't I was bad and Jesus made me good. The problem was I was dead and Jesus made me alive. That's what Jesus does when he comes into our lives. The person who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. So if you don't hear anything I say today, I want you to hear this, that if you don't let your past die, it won't let you live. If you don't let your past die, it won't let you live. And maybe, just maybe here today, somebody is gonna have to step out of your history in order to step into your destiny. Because so many people are caught up in our history. And do you know that living in our history will prevent us from stepping into our destiny? 
Now, if anybody in this room knows about getting past the past, it's Captain Stupid right here on stage. And so for me, I wrote down three thoughts along with this verse that kind of keep me grounded anytime I have trouble dealing with my past. So if you're taking notes, write this down. And if you're not taking notes, write this down because the devil hates it when you take notes. <laughs> Number one, in Christ, in Christ, I am completely forgiven. Aren't you glad that Jesus didn't just partially forgive? He completely forgives. Now, real quick, real quick survey. I need everybody to participate. This is an all skate. It's not a very spiritual question. It's just a question to ask you about a certain life circumstance. How many of you have ever purchased a new car? Raise your hand, raise it high. Raise your hand, raise it high. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Dave Ramsey would be mad, but, 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 but I'm excited about it. Notice my hand was up. I remember the first new car I bought, it was awesome, it was an SUV, because my car needs to beat your car in a wreck. And so I bought an SUV, it was awesome, it was massive, had leather seats, had heated seats, I'd never had heated seats before. It, it was incredible, and I drove that thing for about two weeks. And then one day, I was backing out of my driveway, and somebody moved my mailbox. <laughs> No, they did, because I hadn't always been there. Somebody came in the middle of the night, and I'm convinced moved my mailbox, but I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer, so when I'm backing up, I hit my mailbox, and it was like, <clears throat> I was like, oh, I've hit something. No, I didn't. So I just kept going and put a really nice racing stripe down my car, right? Now, in the South, you get credit for racing stripes on certain automobiles, but not on your brand new SUV. I remember I got out and looked at that dent and almost threw up. It was sickening, sickening. I went to work that day. I was having a real good day. You know how it is. You kind of forget. You kind of forget. I walked back out, looked at the dent, and just about threw up. Every time, I, it didn't matter what kind of day I was having, every time I looked at the dent, by the way, that I had made, it made me sick. And that's how it can be in our lives if we've got something in our past. We can be having the best day in the world and all of a sudden we see him or we see her or we hear that song that reminds us of that season and all of a sudden we are flooded with guilt pain and shame because of what we did. And if that's you here today, I get it. I understand. But the beautiful thing about the gospel is this, that in Christ and only in Christ, I, you, we are completely forgiven. You know why we feel so condemned? Two reasons, two reasons. Number one, we know who we really are. Like, we not only know the sins that other people know, we know the sins that we committed that nobody else knows. We know the things we thought about, and every person in this room wonders this at the core of their being. If people knew who I really was, would they really love me? That's heavy, isn't it? The other reason we feel so condemned, and I'm not cracking on and I'm all about it, is most of us are on social media. And on social media, we see everybody's highlight reel. Oh my gosh, they have perfect pets, they have perfect children, they eat perfect food. <laughs> but we don't know that especially the ladies took 72 selfies before they found the one that they were gonna put on Instagram, hello. Don't get mad at me because I'm preaching the gospel right now. <laughs> oh, oh, and by the way, if there's a group photo, when you look at the group photo, who's the first person you look at? You. And if you look good, the picture looks good. And if you don't look good, take the picture down. <laughs> so 
So we feel condemned because of what we know about ourselves. We feel condemned because we look at other people. But something else that Paul said in Romans chapter eight, verse one, is so now there is, there is no condemnation, no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. There's no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. So guess what? He knows about the abortion. He knows about the affair. He knows about the adultery. He knows about the thing that nobody else knows about and you and I are completely forgiven anyway. That's something, church, that we can celebrate. All of us have dents. All of us have dents. But as a Christian, my life is not found in the identity of my dents, but in the death of Jesus on the cross. And the death of Jesus on the cross are bigger than the dents that I've caused in my life and in the life of others. I love, um, there's a story and you don't have to turn there, but John chapter eight, John chapter eight, um, is a story about a woman who was caught in the act of adultery. How many of you are familiar with that story? How many of you know what I'm talking about? If not, you can read it, but not during my message, another time. Um, (laughs) John chapter eight, there was a woman and the Bible says, don't miss this, that she was caught in the act of adultery. Imagine how scandalous that was. Like somebody didn't see a tweet about her. Somebody didn't see an Instagram story. Like she was caught in the act of adultery and then brought to Jesus who was teaching in the temple. And they were trying to trap him. And there were a bunch of Pharisees around holding rocks, getting ready to stone this woman. And hey, there's something I've learned about Christians who are self-righteous, they all carry rocks. Mm. (laughs) Yeah, some of you are like. (laughs) And so, so Jordan, I want you to come up here. He's gonna be the woman caught in adultery. Um, And and so so I, I I wanna show you a picture of what Jesus does for us when we come in front of him caught in our sin. So they bring the woman caught, let me step over this way just a little bit, there we go, we're great. So they bring the woman caught in adultery before Jesus and they're saying this woman was caught in adultery, what do we do, what do we do, what do we do? And the Bible says that Jesus bent down. That's the first thing it says about Jesus, that he bent down. And that's an incredible picture, don't miss this. The Bible says God became man that Jesus humbled himself. So instead of taking a posture over this woman, he demonstrated how he humbled himself in front of this woman. Oh, it gets better, it gets better. And the Bible says he took his finger, I've always wondered which finger he used, and he put it on the ground. Now. Um, Mel Gibson made that movie, The Passion of the Christ, and it was great because a lot of Christians didn't go to R-rated movies until the one that came out about Jesus was rated R, and then we all went to rated R movies again. Um, But in that movie, he he does his finger like this, and it's dust. But archaeologists have shown us that the ground where Jesus was, he was in the temple. In the temple, Herod would have had that entire place covered in marble. So the ground wasn't dusty, the ground was stone. Don't miss this. Finger to stone. So Jesus took a posture of humility and put his finger to the stone. Finger to the stone. Finger to the stone. Where else in the Bible did the finger of God touch a stone? Ten Commandments. What is one of the Ten Commandments? Thou shalt not commit adultery. So the one who wrote, thou shalt not commit adultery, eventually stood to the woman and said, woman, where are your accusers? And she said, they've gone. Then he said, neither do I accuse you. Go now and leave your life of sin, demonstrating that in the in Christ, all of us are completely, completely, completely forgiven. Thanks, man. Forgiveness is not achieved, it's received. And I gotta tell you, sometimes I don't feel forgiven. Sometimes I don't feel forgiven, but the facts in God's word are greater than the feelings in my life. So I've discovered that what I don't feel forgiven 
I've just got to celebrate that I am forgiven. I've just got to start celebrating the cross. I've just got to start celebrating the scriptures. I've just got to start celebrating that the tomb is empty. I've got to start celebrating that there is a God who knew every stupid, foolish, sinful thing that I would ever do, and he still saved me and arranged for the payment for that sin to be made. The good news is this, that in Christ and only in Christ, you, I, we are completely forgiven. Number two, in Christ, I am valuable. I am valuable. Years ago, years ago, years ago, I worked at a place called Ryan's. Y'all remember Ryan's? It's great. And um, I worked my way up to cashier. And I started in the dish room. So when you worked your way up to cashier, that was a big deal. And I remember I'd take people's money. I was making changes, doing all this stuff. And one day this guy, I never will forget this guy comes in and he, he's got a hood pulled over his head. And it was like May. And I was like, this is weird. He's wearing a hood in May. And this was like 1990 where nobody wore hoodies, right? Um, and then he had on gloves. And I literally had this thought, huh, that'd be funny if he tried to rob me. <laughs> And it was funny, right up until I opened the cash register and he reached inside his jacket and he pulled out the most massive knife I've ever seen in my life. He was like, <laughs> my name is Iga Montoya. <laughs> anyway, some of you, I don't have time, I don't have time. <laughs> and he said, give me the money. And I was like, I hit the little button on the cash register. I was like, hey man, it's yours. You can have it all. You want a steak? You want a, you want a roll? I'll get you a biscuit. Like, well, I just, whatever you need, man. And every once in a while, I'll meet a redneck who would go, why didn't you fight him? Because <laughs> it wasn't my money, stupid. I would have carried it to the car for him. See, he wasn't after my money. He was after Ryan's money. And I knew Ryan had some money. <laughs> but had he said, and you give me your wallet, now that's where we'd have drawn the line. <laughs> and the reason's very simple. It's not because I had credit cards in my wallet, because at the time I didn't have any credit cards. It's not because I had a lot of money in my wallet, because at the time I didn't have a lot of money. The reason he couldn't have my wallet is because my driver's license is in my wallet. And if he would have taken my driver's license, I would have had to go to the DMV. And I would rather be stabbed 17 times <laughs> than go to the DMV. Now, I know there's probably somebody here going, I work at the DMV. Well, sucks to be you. Put a smile on your face and act like you're glad to see somebody. My gosh. My wallet, because it has my license, is valuable, and because something is valuable, if something truly is valuable, you're willing to lay down your life, right? Now, I'll talk to the mamas for a second. There's some mamas in the room, and mamas, they're all nice and sweet. No, that's, that's just kidding. You mess with one of their kids. I have seen moms transform into alien. Y'all remember the movie? Terminator. You know why? Because you mess with something that was valuable. And there are people in this room, there are people in this room that you don't think you're valuable because of what you've done or because of what's been done to you. There are people in this room that you think you're a mistake. Your parents told you that. Your parents told you, you know, we didn't, we didn't plan on you. You're a mistake. You, there are people in this room, listen, even our culture is teaching you that you are an accident. Now, I'm not here to start a fight, but the whole evolution argument tells you that you just got here, and we don't know how. There was one cell, 
And it turned into two cells. And two cells turned into four cells. Four cells turned into a tadpole. And the tadpole turned into a frog. And the frog hopped up on the land and turned into a bunny rabbit. And the bunny rabbit hopped around eventually and turned into a cat. And then the cat turned into a dog. And the dog turned into a monkey. And the monkey climbed a tree and he went to sleep and he came back down and he went to Target and he bought a razor and he shaved and he became a man. It's kind of like from goo to you by way of the zoo. And there is no reason for you to be on this planet. But I have a Bible that tells me I was fearfully and wonderfully made by the hand of God, and God doesn't make garbage. You, you were custom designed by the hand of God. And I think we could all agree on this, that the value of something is determined by the price that someone is willing to pay. Would you agree? Like I see paintings that sell for like $2 million and I'm like, I don't get it. I wouldn't have paid that, but somebody did. In football, um, Deshaun Watson, the former quarterback for the Clemson Tigers, just signed a deal with the Houston Texans. I wrote this down. Four years, $13.8 million with a $9 million signing bonus. Do they think he's valuable? Yeah, because they invested in him. Now, every time you talk about that, there's some idiot that goes, all that money won't make you happy. (laughs) I'd love to give it a shot. Have you ever noticed broke people are the only people that say that? <laughs> See, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. And the way that that happened is Jesus gave his life for us on the cross, and if the value of something is determined by the price that someone is willing to pay, and Jesus gave his life for us on the cross, that means that you, I, we, are intrinsically value valuable to the Son of God, even in a world that tells us that we're not. In Christ, I am valuable because the value of my life is not determined by the mess I've made, but by the price that Jesus paid. Number three, in Christ, I am unconditionally loved. In Christ, I am unconditionally loved. And I gotta be honest, I don't unconditionally love people. And don't judge me because you don't either. (laughs) Yesterday on my drive up to Charlotte, I experienced the person in the left lane You do know why it's the left lane. What are you supposed to do in the left lane? Pass. Pass. You're supposed to break the speed limit in the left lane. It says in Second Hesitations, chapter four, verse eight. (laughs) Don't look that up on you, verse, and it's not there. Some of you are like, really? (laughs) I, 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 I have a problem with that. I have a problem. I have a problem with close talkers. Have you ever met a close talker? Like they're like right here. You're like, are you gonna slip me the tongue right now? Like, what are we doing right here? You're kind of backing up the entire time, right? I have a problem. I said slip the tongue. I can't believe I didn't say that last night. We won't put this one online. I have a problem loving certain people, and you do too, but let's go back to the parents for just a second. You know who I don't have a problem loving? My daughter, Karis. And it's not because she's earned it. (laughs) Come on, come on, parents. How many of you are parents? Moms and dads, raise your hand. Okay, moms always raise their hand and dad's like, I don't know, because you know, mama's baby, daddy's maybe. But, but, but if you, uh, come, come on, come on. If you're a parent, raise your hand, get them up, get them up. Okay, yeah, now, wh- that's the reason you love your children, because they're yours. They did not deserve your love. They arrived on this planet with an attitude, screaming, and none of them in the middle of the night said, oh, mommy, I am concerned for your well-being and your sleep. 
I will delay my gratification of eating just a little while. No, 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 no. And they start toddling. And when they start toddling, why is it that they can find every deadly instrument in the house? I don't understand that. And then they become teenagers. <laughs> so it's not like they earned our love. You know the reason you love your children? Because they're your children. You don't love them because of their performance. You love them because of their position as your child. Am I right? And you love them even when they're messy. See, I want to talk to the person here today that your past is messy. Your present is messy. And you have a hard time believing that God could actually love you. I get it. I get it. But isn't it funny what the Lord will teach you about his love through your own children? Huh. I went to get Karis out of her room one morning. She was about two. And I was going to take her on a little date. We always do a little date. She always wants to go to the Waffle House. I've asked her, can we go somewhere else that doesn't take 10 years off your father's life every time we walk in? <laughs> no, sir, daddy. Okay, well, that's good. It's good. So I walked into the room, and this is a true story. I opened the door, and there was a smell that greeted me. <laughs> that just about knocked me down. And I was like, what? is that smell. And I walked around the corner and she's sitting on her bed and she'd had a stomach virus the night before. Okay, now I'm not going to go into intrinsic detail about this because we have sympathetic vomiters in the room and then if, if you know, like if you blaze, we all blaze and so we're not, we're not, we're not going to do that, all right? Because I don't want people just like, that would be a remarkable experience but I'm not trying to create that here at Elevation Church on any campus. But let's just say she'd gotten real sick. Real sick like sick on the wall, sick on the carpet, sick on the bedspread, sick all over her pajamas. And I walked around the corner and I stood there and I looked at her mess and I was a little grossed out <laughs> until she turned around and looked at me and made eye contact with me and held her arms out and said, Daddy, now, let me tell you what I did not do. I didn't say, Daddy, girl, you better recognize who you're talking to right now. I'll tell you what. Why don't you clean yourself up? Why don't you clean up that wall? Why don't you clean up that bedspread? Why don't you clean up that carpet? Why don't you clean yourself up? And then when you get clean and everything else gets clean, I will let you come into my presence. No, you know what I did as her father? I picked her up in her mess. I embraced her in her mess. I cleaned up her mess because as her daddy, I'm bigger than the mess that she made. And we have a God in heaven who's bigger than the mess that we've made in our life. The price he paid is bigger than the mess we've made. And in Christ, we are unconditionally loved. Think about the people in the Bible that God loved that didn't deserve it. We call them Bible heroes, but they're not that heroic because they all had problems just like we've got problems. We tell, how did Noah get to be a Bible hero? that happen? Some people, well, he's a man of faith. You know, God told him to build an ark, and he built an ark, and he built the ark, and he got his family on there, and he got all the animals on there, and he saved the world. Yeah, 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 yeah. Except for, except for, except for Genesis 9. The Bible says Noah planted a vineyard, drank wine, got drunk and naked, passed out, and woke up and cussed out his grandchild. Like, if you grew up in church, I don't think we could flannel graph that, right? Here's Noah, here's drunk, he's, he's passed out, he's speaking cursive. Um, like, like we, we can't really figure that, but he gets to be a hero in the Bible. 
Abraham took matters into his own hands several times and didn't trust God. Yet Abraham gets to be a hero in the Bible. David was a man who committed murder and adultery, yet he gets called a man after God's own heart. Thomas actually doubted the resurrection and he gets to be a hero in the Bible. Peter denied Christ three times and 50 days later, he got to preach on the day of Pentecost. I'm not saying that the Bible gives us an excuse for sin because some people get nervous when you start talking about grace because they don't realize they need it too. And they say, Perry, don't tell them about grace. Don't tell them about grace. Don't tell them about grace. Because if you teach grace, they'll leave this place and go live however they want. But that's not true because when we understand grace in its purest form, we will leave, leave from here and do whatever he wants because his plans are greater than our plans. In Christ, in Christ, I am un conditionally loved, and so are you, and so are you. I don't care what you've done. I don't care what's been done to you. In Christ, you are unconditionally loved. You are completely valuable, and you are completely forgiven, and if you're not in Christ, you can have that relationship starting today. Because here's the thing I know about the scriptures. Every person I read about in this book needed the forgiveness of God. And if God did it then, he can do it again. And if he did it back then, he can do it right here. And I don't know about you, but I'm thankful that Jesus Christ forgave my sins, power washed my soul, made me into a brand new person, finds me valuable, placed value on me, created me for a greater purpose than myself, unconditionally loves me when I find it hard even to love myself. And if he did it then, he can do it again. If he did it then, he can do it again. If if he did it then, he can do it again.